Okay, hello everybody, and you're very welcome to this webinar on cultural intersections. My name is Patrick Lonergan. I'm Professor of Drama and Theatre Studies here at NUI Galway, and I will be chairing today's panel. Um, we have a lot to cover in a relatively short period of time, so I'll keep my introductions fairly brief. NUI Galway is a university that prides itself on having a strong tradition in the creative arts, and that is a tradition that manifests itself in many ways. So, for example, we have staff who practice creative art um, as part of the work that they do as novelists, as filmmakers, as poets, and in many other ways. We also have students who do creative arts practice, both in its own right and as a form of research through practice based research projects. We have students who have moved from the university into the creative arts professions in Galway, um, including in areas such as cultural heritage. And then we have creative arts organizations and cultural organizations that partner with the university, um, partner with us to do research, to do teaching, and to do work that has societal impact and value for our communities. So we're interested in talking about the Galway case as something that we hope might be um, relevant in other contexts. We're very interested in, in hearing how our experience might match up with experiences in our in life partners countries and um, how we might work together in the future anything else that might come up in the course of the discussion so what will happen is in today's panel we have a, a great group of speakers who, who represent those slightly different versions of the relationship between the university and the creative arts that i've outlined the speakers are in alphabetical order first of all john crumlish who is the managing director and the ceo of the galway international arts festival Following John, we'll hear from Jeremy Sirkuk, who is a performer and a choreographer who is completing a practice-based PhD at NUI Galway. Next, we will hear from Alison Green, who is a graduate of NUI Galway and who is working with McAllister Distillery. We'll hear then from Ulla Hockenen, who is the Executive Creative Director of Galway Community Circus. Again, another partner of the university working with us in Creative Europe and Erasmus Plus projects. And then the final speaker will be Mraid Nikronin, who is the Druid Theatre uh, theater Artist in Residence at NUI Galway, and also the co-director of Moonfish Theatre Company. So each of our panelists is gonna speak briefly for about five minutes each uh, about how the work they does how the work they do links up with the university. That will bring us up to around five o'clock and after that time we will invite you to, to put your comments or your questions into the Q&A section of the Zoom interface. So just hold on with any questions you have until that time. Um, that'll take us up to about 25 past five when my colleague, Dr. Charlotte McIver, is going to introduce some of the performances that we have for you this evening as well. So that's our introductions. Um, let me then move to John Crumlish and invite John to speak, please. Patrick, thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I should say that I'm a former student of the university and it probably helped shape what I ultimately became, as I came from a small town in the most northern county. So it was my first real engagement with culture on a regular basis. There was a film society, drama society, and an awful lot of music. And given away my age, there was a young band called U2, who used to play the university quite regularly at that stage of their careers. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Arts Festival is 44 years old. It's a multidisciplinary festival. And in 2019, our last normal year, we had over 260,000 attendances at 200 events over the 14 days of the festival in July. Uh, it also produces its own theatre, which it tours nationally and internationally, and is a discussion platform called First Thought. Uh, the partnership with the university goes back 10 years, and uh, it has grown in that time, uh, and now focuses on two main pillars. The first one, obviously, is education. Uh, and that's focused on three key programs. One is Selected, where we work with the university on an academy for university students who wish to have a professional career in the arts. We're also a partner on the new MA in the Creative Arts. And very important, the university works with us on our volunteer program to help us deliver a best practice volunteer program. 
In 2019, we had a thousand volunteers from 55 countries, and it's an integral part of what we do. So having the university help us develop best practices has been hugely advantageous uh, over the last number of years. Uh, the second kind of pillar around which we build things is looking at the university as a cultural campus. Uh, we present an awful lot of work on the campus, uh, usually in the form of visual arts installations, some gallery work, uh, a lot of our discussion platform events happen on the university, and some of our music happens as well. Uh, a personal favourite of mine was to hear Brian Wilson do the whole lot of uh, the seminal work, Pet Sounds Live, and if I never heard anything else again, that would do me rightly. So that is very big for us. A big part as well is we work very closely with the library uh, in terms of creating a best practice archive. We bring an awful lot of world-class art into Galway and specifically onto the campus, and we want to archive that and work closely with the uh, library on that. We also are starting to engage with the alumni around our national touring, and uh, we also very much work with the university on First Thought, the discussion platform. They have a, a fair amount of participants involved in it. And most importantly, in First Thought Backstage, uh, it's basically people from Professor Lonigan's department who interview all the major creatives uh, who do shows for us. And again, that is archived and very important for us. So basically it runs over those two key platforms in terms of development and also in terms of the presentation work. And in the next phase, and why this is so important to us, we very much want to engage with the university around developing the creative industries in the West of Ireland. So thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks, John. And John, uh, John I know John's um, picture there was freezing occasion occasionally, but we could hear you clearly, John. So, um, so glad to um, glad to be able to do that. So thanks, John. We'll move now to Jeremy. Hi. Um, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, John, for that. That was, that was really great. Um, so yeah, so my name is Jeremy Sir Cook. Um, I'm a performer, uh, a movement director, and a choreographer in Galway. I'm also um, the artistic director of Kushla Production, which is an independent physical theatre company in the city. And um, I'm doing a practice-based PhD in uh, drama and theatre studies, looking at um, physical theatre as a methodology of adaptation uh, specifically of, of literary text. And I guess I wanted to use a little bit of, of my own experience and observations from, from my work with the university and, and the wider creative and, and artistic community in Galway. Um, and what I find really interesting in, in, in Galway is that, that our campus of NUIG is that it's, it's an integral part um, of the city, both structurally, but also in terms of, of the culture and the life of the city. I think many of the folks in Galway um, do identify with NUIG either as alumni or current students or staff and employees or um, and when it comes to, to the artistic and creative community, I think many artists and arts organizations are uh, recognize that NUIG is a, is a platform with which they can engage in some shape or form. And for me, for example, when, when I first came to, to do my master's in a, at NUI years ago, um, I mean, I was 21, I didn't know anybody, I didn't have any family or any kind of support system here, and I was just dropped into the city uh, ambitious and creative artist and and the university really really helped me um, and facilitated that outgoing communication and networking with um, organizations like like Corch and like Galway Theatre Festival and the International Arts Festival of course um, and I had the opportunity in my first year here that to to present a, a piece of dance theater that I had developed as part of the masters um, and I presented it as part of the theater festival and even the following year then um, that kind of repeated itself and I ended up touring a show which I had developed as part of my dissertation for the masters. Um, and even before I think I started the PhD, my relationship with the university, both as an artist, never really ended. Um, and that relationship, both as a physical space, but also with, with its staff and its students, never ended. Um, I mean, the university became for me a staple in my ability to create work and do work um, in offering me some valuable, some valuable 
space to to develop and and uh, and create new projects, um, which then went on to tour and, and was presented outside of the university grounds. But it was also it also served as a platform for me to engage and gather a community of people who were interested in artistic innovations and endeavors and kind of explore and experiment with new ideas. Um, to give you a bit of an example on that, I mean, most recently I got the chance as part of my, my PhD, I got the chance to, to explore um, and experiment with a new way of developing and presenting a theatrical work in light of COVID, which was really made for live stream. Um, and I, I think it is part of the program after the Q&A, so feel free to, to watch that. But I really wouldn't have been able to do that without the university's help or, or their engagement and their support in, in fostering that creative space. Um, what I find interesting is that, you know, what is a university but a space for innovation and creativity? And I think generally universities have that opportunity and, and that resp responsibility to advocate and engage with artists and cultural partners um, as well as work towards holding that space of and for innovation and creativity and i think nui does that really well so that's my experience great thank you and and again as as jeremy said you'll have an opportunity to see some of that work um, just after this panel concludes I can see that somebody, one of our attendees has a hand up uh, pressed, that might be an accident, but just to say, we will be taking questions and comments in the chat or the Q&A button um, later on. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to, to send your comments to the speakers and to engage in dialogue. Uh, but let's move straight to Alison, please. Hi there, uh, my name is Alison Green. I am an NUI Galway alum. Um, I studied a BA in Drama, Theatre and Performance and English from NUI Galway and graduated in 2017. Um, I went into university thinking that I would, wanting to become an actress. Um, and then it was quite quickly that I realized actually that wasn't the right path for me. And it was really um, my, three, four years in college that I, I found my, my path kind of through three main ways. First of all, my third year internship, I interned with Druid Theatre Company. Um, and then um, I started to see this whole other world of how theatre was made and the core and um, teams that actually are there from the beginning through to the very end and the different layers of theatre making and the different layers of, of um, in the art sector and the roles that are available to the, um, people there and then um, also through modules like um, I took an advanced drama module in my final year of college which was about putting on a show but it, from all aspects administration finance venue management and it was here that I saw the pieces that that um, worked towards the, the final product. And then also I was quite involved in um, university societies like DramSoc and GUMS where I was PR officer. So it was really my time, my undergrad that I got a fully informed idea of what um, the art sector was made up of. Um, on the advice of some of my lectures in NUI Galway, I went on to study an MA in cultural policy and arts management in the university. College Dublin, where I studied modules like marketing, law, and um, accountancy management, but all in a creative sector um, and geared towards working within the arts. So um, from there, it led to another internship um, with Business Arts in Dublin, um, which is a company that builds creative partnerships between arts and business organizations. And from there, I got uh, came back to Galway and I got a job with Druid Theatre Company, which was totally full circle for me from my undergrad internship just a few years um, previous to becoming the marketing and communications lead at Druid, which was a dream come true because it was such a highly regarded theatre company and such a wonderful reputation and some, something that I, a company that I admired for most of my life and um, being born and raised in Galway. Um, and then also my university lecturers suddenly became my colleagues. So I was working alongside them um, via uh, programs like Druid Academy, which Marie will probably touch on, and various other projects um, between the company and the university. Um, a highlight was participating in a masterclass series where I 
and delivered a class on marketing the arts but to MA students and PhD students many of whom had studied the same course as me or in the same situation I had been in in just a short few short years before that and um, so that was an honor to hopefully be able to offer them some kind of guidance or advice um, and then just three weeks ago I took up a new position um, so I am now working as marketing communications lead at McAllister Distillers and um, McAllister Distillery Ahaskra is going to be a brand new whiskey and gin distillery in my home village um, which is Ahaskra and in East Galway it's a very rural area about an hour from Galway city and it has approximately 200 people in population it's tiny um, so it was a change obviously it, it's so it's going to be a distillery visitor center shop and cafe and they're under construction at the moment halted by COVID but will uh, resume soon and um, it's going to be a renovation of a Hasker mill which dates back to about the early 1800s and um, and up until the 1950s it processed grain into flour but has been derelict for about 70 years now and um, so I'm moving from an arts from the art sector into a hospitality sector but also a very creative role working in heritage um, and and uh, I'm kind of blessed because although I will be doing a traditional marketing communications role, marketing whiskey and the visitor experience also, um, I'll be engaging with the local community and piecing together the history of the mill and curating a visitor experience from that. So it's really exciting career move for me, but also on a personal level, it's so exciting to be a part of something that's going to have such a huge um, impact on my tiny village and on the people um, in the community in East Galway as well. So something I'm really looking forward to. Good, Alison, thanks very much. So I think you probably have your first visitors already lined up, so that's good. <laughs> um, thanks, we're gonna go to Ula now, and I have some pictures that I can show while, you, while Ula's talking as well, but why don't you start and I can show them while you're doing that, is that okay? That's perfect, thanks so much, Patrick, and uh, great to be here today. Um, so, as Patrick was saying, my name is Ula. I'm the Executive Creative Director of Galway Community Circus. And uh, we are Ireland's flagship for youth and social service. Um, this means that we use circus arts as a tool to advance um, the, the artistic, uh, social and personal development of, of young people. We're based here in Galway City. But uh, we work, work very much on a, on a local, national, and also international level. We uh, run a community service school here in, in Galway with uh, 600 weekly members. Well, this was uh, before COVID hit. Um, at the moment, we are, we are doing uh, classes online. Um, we also run programs in schools and for youth and community groups around the country. And um, we work very actively, actively on an international and particularly European level to develop this art form here in Ireland and internationally. Mm, I should say maybe that contemporary circus and particularly what we do, so this youth and social circus, is, it's very small but growing sector in Ireland. So for us, uh, having a partner uh, with, the, with the local universities is really vital to, to uh, develop this art form long term. Um, we we began our partnership uh, with NY anyway Galway um, and particularly the O'Donoghue Centre for Drama, Theatre and Performance a couple of years ago, maybe um, three or four years ago, I'd say. And um, we are working very actively together, particularly on two different uh, European partnership projects that I'll uh, tell you a little bit about. The, the first project um, that we partner on is, um, is called Service Plus Plus. And this is a three year long Erasmus Plus funded um, partnership that um, it's, a, it's a research project and it's actually uh, the second phase of a long-term research that started back in uh, 2014 already. It's a, it's a partnership between um, five uh, circus schools like, like ourselves and uh, three universities from, um, who do we have? Finland, Sweden, Czech Republic, um, France, and Ireland. And um, 
during this research, together with our European partners, we are uh, developing um, a degree program, and it's actually a world's first uh, BA degree course for youth and social circus. So it's a uh, really exciting and, uh, and a very important project for us. Um, right now, I'm working with uh, Dr. Ian Walsh from NUI Galway on a national national implementation plan for Ireland to to see how can we uh, deliver this future BA course here in Ireland. And, um, and the aim is that in, uh, in the coming years, uh, this degree will be, will be delivered by the partner universities around Europe. We also partner with uh, NUI Galway on a Creative, Creative Europe funded project called uh, Wires Crossed Head Heart Balance. Uh, this is a, a project that we developed uh, with and for uh, Galway 2020 European Capital of Culture. Um, it's a partnership between three sub schools and two universities from um, Belgium, uh, Romania and Ireland. And um, this, this project would focus on uh, developing funambulism, which is a high wire walking, as an, as an art form and as a participatory practice with a significant well-being impact. Um, one of the parts of this project is uh, that we are um, publish publishing uh, scientific research on the neurological effects of funambulism on the brain. Um, anyway, Galway's role in this, in this particular project is um, to be the, the evaluator of, of the three-year program. So, um, yeah, as, as well as these two European projects, um, uh, we also host uh, NUI Colway students on internships. Um, we've been a visiting lecturer on, on some courses. And um, many of our participants and artists would be either current or former students of NUI Colway. And, um, and also the two organizations are just around the corner from each other. So, so we very much see NUI Galway as a, as a key partner in a local, national, and international um, context. And um, we are very much looking forward to continuing and, and further developing this partnership to, to provide really meaningful learning opportunities for the students, to build the capacity of, of our organization and, um, and to work together to, to develop the Irish service arts sector. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, really wonderful. And nice to see those pictures as well of people being together outside and inside and enjoying themselves so much. Um, so I, I see we have a question in the Q&A and I'll hold off on those questions until everybody has finished. But we, we just have one more speaker actually to, to deliver some remarks and that's Mairead Necronin. So um, let's hear from Mairead. Hi, thanks Patrick and thanks everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Mairead Necronin. I'm a former PhD student of the Department of Drama and Theatre Studies, uh, now a doctor. And I've been a practicing theatre maker in Galway for the last 15 years here. And I'm currently Druid Theatre Artist in Residence here at the University. So in my professional career in theatre, I'm co-founder and co-director of Moonfish Theatre, which is a bilingual ensemble company. We work in Irish and English. Um, and we're based here in Galway. And we began as a lot of graduates do with profit share productions that we financed ourselves and performed in cafes and small theatres. And since then, we've been lucky enough to be able to go on from there to develop the company, present work with partners like the Abbey Theatre, which is the National Theatre of Ireland and the Goey International Arts Festival. Uh, we've toured our work here around Ireland and in the United States. And we've been supported by uh, funders such as the Arts Council, Culture Ireland and Galway City Council. And so part of the um, information and the knowledge uh, that I love sharing as part of teaching here in the department is, first of all, the practice aspect of Moonfish. So working as an ensemble and what that entails and uh, the different ways that you can create and devise work and um, using that practice. And then also the professional development aspect. So one of my goals when I'm teaching students here is to give them a sense of what is possible how do you get from being a student or a young graduate to working professionally in theatre and what does that entail? And I think being exposed to the nuts and bolts of how professional theatre making is crafted really demystifies it for a lot of students. And it can be really enriching because it can provide a kind of professional toolbox that they can take with them on their journey out beyond the university. And my professional experience feeds into my role as Druid Theatre Artist in Residence 
which involves overseeing, as Alison was mentioning, the uh, links between Druid Theatre Company, which is an internationally renowned theatre company based here in Galway, and the Department of Drama and Theatre Studies. So as part of this role, I put together a programme of engagement for the students, uh, particularly the MA students, but other students as well, um, that runs throughout the year. So that involves master classes, shows, behind the scenes visits, and other events. And one of the really interesting aspects about this partnership that I think is quite unique is, that has emerged is the way that it really has a, there's a sustained link between this one theatre company and uh, the department and how that can allow students to follow and interact with uh, a theatre production right from its gestation. So talking to the people who have a role maybe in how the theatre production is first conceived and imagined, the producer who is in first uh, conversations with the writer or the director's first vision, uh, all the way through, charting that all the way through to how a production is actually then manifested on stage, how it is marketed and communicated as an, uh, and as Alison said, uh, she gave a wonderful presentation to the MAs on the marketing and communications around the Cherry Orchard live stream from Druid last year. Um, and I think, again, of course, uh, they get to see the show, sometimes the dress rehearsal. And again, this really offers an exciting opportunity uh, for students uh, to get a really in-depth insight into the workings of theatre. It allows them to meet um, practitioners, make connections with those professionals, and get a really practical insight into the different roles and responsibilities in professional theatre. Um, wearing my own individual practice hat and what I received my PhD for, I also work in digital media and theatre, so I work a lot in creating uh, works of performance that involve digital audio and uh, 360 film and different aspects like that, and I'm very lucky to be partnering with the University in the Moore Institute on some of that work um, now and into the future. Uh, wearing another hat, I was also director of Galway Theatre Festival for four years and uh, programmed uh, one of Jeremy's works, uh, which was really great. And uh, the Theatre Festival is a curated festival of work by young and emerging theatre makers from Galway and, and around Ireland. And this role allowed me um, to move from being a maker into being a festival curator and really allowed me to approach uh, theatre, I suppose, from an opposite perspective, because it made me aware of the uh, young artists and companies who were looking to present work at the festival and how they were NUIG graduates and really aware of, I suppose, the wider theatrical ecology in the city and how NUIG is such an integral part of that. Because as, as Jeremy was saying, um, there is such a fund of resources available for the students after they graduate that they can make use of when they're on their first steps into the professional world. So that's me. That's great. Thank you very much, Mairead. And thank you to all of our panellists for those introductory remarks. We've covered a huge amount in a, in a relatively short period of time, and I'm sure there'll be questions. So to our attendees, I would like to invite comments, questions. We'd love to hear your questions. We'd love to hear of things you yourselves are doing as well. And we have about 25 minutes in which to do this. So I, I can see we already have one question in the Q&A and I'll come to that in a moment. You can pop a question in the Q&A or you can pop a question in the chat and I will read the questions aloud and direct them um, appropriately. But I thought it might be good um, actually to start with, with John for the first question, which relates to Galway 2020. And so the question is asking about the ongoing evaluation and monitoring of projects, um, but maybe just to expand that a little bit and think about the, the impact of Galway 2020, because like John, when you think about the impact of the, the arts festival, the International Arts Festival on our campus alone, I remember reading a report that said that I think two years ago, because the arts festival had events on our campus, 80,000 visitors came to NUI Galway in the space of two weeks. So there's already huge kind of provision of the arts uh, in Galway and Galway 2020, the, the, the European capital of culture was gonna move us up another level again, perhaps. Um, because of COVID, because of the pandemic, it's been significantly scaled back. Could you just maybe say a little bit about perhaps, you know, how, how Galway 2020, what its legacies might be, um, despite the fact that we have had this uncertainty now with COVID. Well, uh, in a very strange and weird way, the majority of the projects will have to take place in, in 21. We're still trying to get to a point where they can actually happen. Uh, I think a, a key legacy is capacity building for organizations. A lot of organizations got doing 
uh, projects that they may not normally have would have been able to do. And they owe between 2016 getting the designation and 2020, capacity had to be built in those organizations to allow for them to be executed properly. In our own case, uh, it involved a, a very large uh, installation, visual arts installation, uh, and it built around digital work. And it really introduced us to a whole new way of looking at installations and how they're developed. We worked with an Irish artist called John Gerard, who basically uses kind of cutting edge gaming technology to deliver artworks. And for us, that was a whole new way of, of looking at things. And in terms of us, it was, it opened us up to very different types of skills that we now are starting to take for granted, but were not even imagined by us in 2016. And I would imagine well, it would be something similar in terms of that capacity building aspect. But I think, unfortunately, due to the disruption, we hadn't a flow at it. But the key things and the key legacy will be the organizational capacity that remains. And then similarly for Ula, you, you mentioned this a little bit that some of your projects um, perhaps won't go ahead in the way that you had intended, but will go ahead in 2021. Is that fair to say? Um, well, yes and no, absolutely. I echo with uh, uh, John there that, um, I mean, for us, I guess our involvement with uh, Galway 2020 was always about the journey and always about the legacy. Of course, uh, our hearts are still a little bit broken in terms of that the, the, the event that we had envisioned for, for last year um, won't be able to go ahead as we had planned. But um, we've already accomplished a lot. I mean, we've been working on this um, since since 2016-17. We've uh, we've run seven different Erasmus Plus projects. We have the Creative Europe project um, uh, confirmed until 2023. Um, we continue to work with our European partners. Um, so even though the event would have been important to have. It's not about that. It's building the capacity of our organization, training uh, circus artists and trainers, um, creating methodology and, and uh, really embedding something into our organization that we can continue long term. So that's not going to be wasted, all, all the kind of learning. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. But also, I think that the way in which you've been able to use European funding mechanisms like Erasmus+, Plus, like Creative Europe, to focus on education, I think, is, is really important for us because what your projects, I think, certainly from a university point of view, I think what they show us is that when you teach young people skills like walking a tightrope, um, like we've all learned a thing or two metaphorically about walking a tightrope over the last year, haven't we? So it's, it's a really good example, isn't it, of how creative arts skills actually are applicable in, in a variety of other contexts as well, isn't it? Absolutely. And now more than ever, I mean, uh, the recovery of our young people after after COVID um, pandemic and, and during it, um, already like funders are recognizing um, that this is uh, one type of vital support for, for mental health, for resilience, anxiety, coping mechanisms and so on. So, so this kind of well-being um, impact of our work is, is really key for us. Yeah, very much. Now, I am keeping an eye on the Q&A and I'm also keeping an eye on the chat. So I do invite uh, contributions from, from our attendees too far away if you, if you have anything you'd like to ask. But I also, I just wanted to pick up on some of the things our panelists have said. And Mairead, I wanted to, to just return for a moment to your work with Moonfish. And some of the work that you do, which is particularly uh, interesting, is in the fact that you used your PhD work in digital projections and so on. But also significant about Moonfish's work is the fact that you're making work in both English and Irish. And so the status of NUI Galway as a bilingual university, the fact that the Irish language is so widely spoken in the West of Ireland, all of those things might explain why Moonfish is in Galway and how it produces the work that it does. Could you maybe say a little bit more about, about language in particular? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's fundamental really to how we make the work um, we really see working bilingually or, or multilingually, we like incorporating other languages as well, but um, as a real advantage when you're making work because it really sparks off, it takes you in, in completely different directions. It can be seen as a challenge, but then because you're constantly trying to think, how do you use, how, how do you make work that doesn't shut audience members out if they don't speak that language? And especially in a live theatre performance, that's a kind of a, a, a live question. But actually, when you introduce that 
question as a challenge, as an artistic challenge, you actually uh, begin to devise really interesting artistic ways of kind of responding to that. And it really opens up, I suppose, theatre making. So for example, in our processes, we're often thinking about ways to translate the Irish for audiences that don't have Irish. And those ways have, you know, included kind of the very kind of Brechtian um, performers coming out with their signs, kind of giving a, a audience members who don't speak Irish a heads up of, you know, in this scene, Pinocchio arrives and meets the cat, you know, for example. Or it can go, uh, as you were kind of saying, um, as far as digital projections where we were kind of using uh, tablets to handwrite um, surtitles live on stage and though those were being projected up and I suppose we're always interested in the fact that translation doesn't necessarily have to be word for word mm -hmm. that you can really um, convey the meaning of what you're trying to say through the different languages of theatre so through gesture through image through song through movement and the the words are there to kind of make sure that people you know, are, are confident that they are getting the, the overall meaning and to kind of guide people on their ways. But we don't really feel that people need to necessarily play, you know, ping pong as, as you often have to do when you're watching sort of a, a theater piece with surtitles. You find yourself kind of moving up and down, kind of looking up and down like this, and it, it kind of detracts from the overall experience. So it's it's been a really important um, artistic kind of inspiration for us really working in the two languages. And I think, like you say, you know, when I think of Galway and and like Alison was saying, the, the university, the language is so integral to um, how people work in the city and and the fact that the city bleeds into the, the wider hinterland and has, you know, a lot to do with kind of the landscape, a lot to do with the sea, a lot to do with our connection to the Iron Islands, um, a lot to do with kind of the, the heritage that's here as well that really kind of informs and roots, I think roots everybody's work really and anyone who's making work in Galway that informs in some way how they are making the work and how they are then um, transmitting that work to other people, what, what they want to share and how they want to share it. Yeah, something we, we talk a lot about in university is that we, we supervise PhD projects and often have to say to our PhD students, the number of academic jobs out there is very limited. Use your PhD for a variety of ways. So you're an example of somebody who, who has used your PhD, yes, to work in a university, but also to practice your art. It, has it been true for you that the, the, the skills you gained as a PhD researcher have fed into your practice very substantially? Oh, absolutely, especially in my uh, individual practice, um, because that has really, it's really opened up a, 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 not an alternative career path, but I suppose a dual career path where I'm making work um, around kind of digital soundscapes and sound walks that take people on different journeys. So, for example, I have a theatre bursary at the moment from the Arts Council of Ireland to work on that. I've also been commissioned by Courch Festival of Literature to create a collaborative project mm -hmm. and by Goway Theatre Festival. So it actually is quite a COVID proof um, trajectory as well, which has been useful in these times. Um, but it's also been really interesting because working my, my PhD is in uh, the intersection between the live and the digital and thinking about the body and embodiment and how digital technologies, instead of taking away from embodiment, can actually enhance embodiment and kind of root us back into the here and now of our experiences. So in my practice, I'm always bringing the sensibilities of being a live theatre practitioner uh, with that awareness of, you know, the, the concept of theatre as, you know, the body in space and time, uh, but then also trying to understand how digital media rather than how we can design digital media I suppose rather than taking us away and out of that to actually bring us back into that lived experience so my PhD really allowed me four years to investigate that and learn about other practitioners making those works think into kind of theories around embodiment and practice and kind of feed that back then into my own practice so I'm, I'm constantly returning actually to my thesis and being, and being intrigued again by the practitioners that I was writing about and the theories that I was writing about. Now Jeremy of course you're at a different stage in that process you're in the second year of a PhD I think um, correct me if I'm wrong but so, so Jeremy I mean similarly you're somebody who had a you had a professional arts practice you were also doing some teaching and things like that as well I think has there, how has the transition worked from going uh, from, from professional practice into the university? Yeah, I think um, the, tra the transition itself, I think, was always um, 
quite similar to to how I, I, I approached my my practice professionally outside, and then coming back in. And I think I'll, I'll I remember kind of coming in and starting my PhD two years ago and, and talking to my supervisor and being like, right, I'm going to consider the next four years as a residency. And I think that was for me because I needed to kind of establish that I, was, I wasn't giving my soul away to academia, if you want. Um, I've since revoked that <laughs> uh, that idea, but because it, not because I don't think that they or I think that there's a binary between academia and, and and the arts and the creative arts, but I think that they they actually are much more integrated um, than than we think they are that we give them credit to. And so um, when I when I first came, I my pra my professional practice in a way in in Ireland at the very least was very much influenced by the way that I had approached it in my masters at NUI. So um, I had brought whatever I had learned from from the masters in terms of reflecting or critically reflecting on on my own work and on my lineage of practices and all of these things and brought that into my professional practice, which then I'm bringing back again into the PhD. Um, so it's it's a it's a relatively smooth continuum in all of that, and now I, I get the chance to to teach others, master's students and other um, undergrad students to to do the same, and I think that that's particularly interesting. So there's a kind of continuum there that that you know that the PhD is part of, but it's only one part of the overall thing that you're going to be doing. I think exactly, and and I envision right now the PhD is is at the end of the continuum, but I envision after I'm done the PhD, you know that that's going to move and the continuum will will keep on going, um, and and my practice, it's whatever I'm doing in. in currently in the PhD, all I'm learning, all the people that I'm looking at and everything that I'm writing about um, will kind of affect the way that I do my practice later on. Um, however, much like Mairead is has kind of experienced herself and I'm, and I'm looking forward to that moment. Yeah, I mean, something else that, that I'd like us to touch on for a minute is, is the way in which culture plays an impact on, on regenerating spaces and places. And so, in Galway in the 1970s, we saw the foundation of the International Arts Festival. We also had the foundation of Druid Theatre. And, and both of those were both uh, a cause and a symptom of, of Galway regenerating itself. So the fact that there was an arts festival brought in tourists and the fact that there would be tourists generated the need for an arts festival and so on. And there's a really interesting model then where, you know, thinking about Alison, a year ago, Alison, you were working with Druid. Druid were doing their first ever live broadcast uh, to cinemas of a production of The Cherry Orchard, The Chekhov Clay, translated by um, Tom Murphy, the Galway playwright. And so that was not just being performed in Galway, it was being beamed all over the world, it was a huge project. And so to, to, to use the skills you've acquired in Druid, this you know, Galway-based company of international stature, but then to bring those skills to a Hasgro, which is very rural, as you said, is there is there an opportunity there to see how the just as Galway kind of was renewed by Druid 45 years ago, that culture heritage um, might do the same for a Haskra? Do you see links there? A hundred percent. And I, I there's a there's certainly a want there by the locals as well. I mean, this was announced um, last summer, so summer 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, and the buzz has stayed there. The locals. Well, first of all, it, it's needed. Um, it, it's a necessity. There's no employment in the area. I mean, it's it's 15 minutes outside Banlaslow, which would be a, a larger town. But again, a, in since kind of the recession, Banlaslow has really disintegrated. There's a, a lack of jobs, a lack of opportunity, and um, a lack of um, youth as well. I, I feel like my age group is non-existent almost um, in the town anymore. So something like this is bringing people back home, including myself. Um, like a perfect example that uh, never in a million years would I have seen myself at the age of 26 returning to my tiny village that I've spent a lot of time trying to get out of. So, uh, but it's amazing that the opportunity is there and that, I, that I'm lucky enough to hopefully play an important part in that. But there's as I said, that, that this will, um, for example, this will create 20 jobs directly and then 70 jobs indirectly, but those 70 jobs are to people who are already living and working there. So it, it's almost like it, it means more to those people than anything. There's also what we're very cautious about is that we're 
the we're coming into a community that although I'm from the community it's existed without us for so long so you have to you know thread carefully and and um, bring the community into the pro become part of a project central to a project and um, and that can't be overlooked and it's and so far it hasn't been um which is brilliant but like you said I think that the the links are there as well that go we needed that at that time and that's what happened and it worked um but you had the backing of that community and you had the the participation and support so although it's not the arts I think participation and support is of the community is just as important in this um situation mm -hmm. um and I I love the fact that it's not just a business coming in opening and, and selling it's going to be a visitor experience for locals and visitors um so it will tell the local stories um and it will engage with them in a, in a more meaningful way than just setting up shop and providing jobs so there's layers to it and mm. um, so yeah I think there's definitely links there yeah but it's a lovely idea is that you know a degree in drama and English that yeah. partly results in a situation in which a community gets to tell its story to itself and that those skills about storytelling and performance are applied in that way 100 percent, yeah Very powerful yeah yeah I think you're going to say something else. Go I on. was just going to say as well, I just thought there as well, like there is um, from a, another thing that spiked my interest when I first got in touch with the owners is there is a performance space as well. So I had phenomenal ideas for this. So maybe I'm, you know, and um, we might meet in the middle somewhere, but like there's definitely an opportunity to engage. Like there's so many, I actually, um, my MA thesis was on amateur drama groups. And um, so I have a, a huge interest in the um practicing amateur drama in the country and the the history there and the importance in these tiny communities for amateur drama and how it's often overlooked obviously it's not funded um so yeah when I saw that there was a performance space I just my mind ran wild but we'll see what happens in the future I'll leave that one for a little while but yeah it's yeah. exciting yeah yeah well you have two theatre artists on, on the zoom with us who might have ideas there too um <laughs> but John I think this this is an example though John of, of how you know regeneration is made possible through partnership and I've heard you talk in other contexts of the fact that you came to you came to Galway to study am I right in saying that you originally studied psychology or something like that so so your your pathway to CEO of one of the you know the major arts festivals in Europe um was was not perhaps the the most straightforward um, in retrospect, but can you just say a little bit about that, about your own journey from Galway? Yeah, well, it, it could never be described as strategic. That is one thing for sure. But basically, the real story is that I volunteered early on the Galway International Arts Festival and saw a show by a French company called Royal Deluxe and was absolutely smitten and thought, what a wonderful way to make a living. And that kind of changed my career path at that point. I was, a, I was a teacher at that stage in an institute of technology in Northern Ireland. And I duly left and uh, ended up back in Galway. I started working with Machnus at, uh, at that stage in terms, just around the stage, they made their first big break with their Gulliver performance. So I worked with them. I volunteered with the Arts Festival. Then I went on the crew of the Arts Festival. Then I became the production manager of the Arts Festival. Then I left, went back to Magnus and came back as CEO. So it was never a straight course. But there, at this stage, there's not many jobs apart from marketing that I haven't done in the Arts Festival at this stage. But it was fantastic because I got to see it grow as well. Like we would do almost as much in a day now as we would have done in a full festival when I was volunteering. But it's great to have seen that evolution. And that show Royal Deluxe, Trish Ford was the artistic director at the time. And it was, it was a jump. Uh, it, it, sorry, it was a leap. And it changed basically what the organization thought about itself. And more importantly, what the town thought about the organization. And over the years, every couple of years, we make a major leap and it changes the perception of us. I would say another major leap was our own festival, Big Top, where we basically increased our capacity and also increased the ability to play on larger stages. For people on the call, this was a huge, for want of a better word, tent, which allowed us to expand a stage size 
to allow us to do much bigger performances, orchestras, big dance companies, and also allowed, it, allowed us to have the audience capacity to allow us to put that on. I think after that, the next big break came with us when we decided to produce our own theatre work. And we moved from a situation of presenting everybody else's to start producing our own work and bringing in artists and mainly Irish artists to help produce new work, which then we took outside Galway and toured nationally and more importantly, internationally. We've got a couple of big breaks and since we were very quickly into London and into New York and built up a network of presenters. And so we've continued on that path and those breaks over those years uh, have been fueled as well, partially by what was coming out of the university and fresh new blood that was continually inputting into the festival and had new ideas and new ways of doing things. And that all fed off each other in a very exciting way over about a 15 year period. Yeah, it's, it is one of the nice things though, is that there's often a disconnection between arts audiences and the people who are studying artworks where you know the age profile in a theater in many european cities is is not necessarily the age profile of people who are in universities and because of the arts festival because it kind of spills over the entire city it's very very inclusive it's um it's very participative and therefore there's much there's a much stronger sense i think for our students that a career in the arts is something available to them because the artists seem much more, you know, close to them in some ways where you're doing the world premiere of, a, of an Enda Walsh play in a, in a given year and they can see Enda Walsh walking down the street or having a coffee outside of a theatre on the campus or whatever. So there's something about the immediacy there that's very powerful, I think. I think also the accessibility was always about access, as creating as much access as possible uh, for audiences, but also for artists and artists and audiences to engage in different ways. So there's a complete lack of formality, which again, in a lot of cases, that lack of formality came out of the lack of infrastructure that you talked about earlier. It was always temporary buildings to begin with. So the formality and the traditions that you would normally associate with cultural infrastructure were never there in a Galway context, mm -hmm. either for the audience or the artists. And that continues to this day. And even as we built up, permanent cultural infrastructure, those kind of lack of formalities and that engagement beyond stages uh, was hugely important. And it was hugely important for us. It was hugely important for audiences, but it was very important for artists as well, because it said Galway was somewhere different. Mm, very good. Um, Ula, John has told us there effectively how he ran away and joined the circus. So, um, how, how did you run away and join the circus and end up in Galway, can I ask? Sure, yeah, I can kind of recognise some of John's story there myself. Um, my journey definitely hasn't been strategic either. Um, I, um, I was actually a mathematics student back in the day in university and then I uh, became a social worker. Um, so my background into the arts kind of comes from the social aspect, uh, social, social work aspect. Um, I came to Ireland on Erasmus, like uh, maybe a lot of listeners have experience in, in this. And, uh, and the thing about Galway is that once you come here, you, you never want to leave, um, unfortunately. So I'm still here almost 20, well, gosh, is it nearly 20 years now later? <laughs> almost. Um, but yeah, but, but, it's, but it's really interesting. So I really feel like uh, my, I have a background um, as a child in youth service. My, my parents parents set up a youth circus in my hometown in a small town in, in Finland and um, circus is something and youth circus is something that is much more um, uh, popular or or a common practice in Finland it's like you know you play soccer you go to circus class it's it's not a not a, a unusual thing to do and um, so I, I was really blessed to have that as a, as a child and then now now in my current job it's been really lovely to be able to combine those very good. We, we have a question in the chat, which I'm going to take, but I'm also keeping an eye on the time. Um, so it's saying that, thank you for the insights. What advice would you give to colleagues from other universities who may be interested in strengthening partnerships with the arts in their respective cities? And I, I might just volunteer an answer to that myself quickly and say that um, certainly from our point of view, I hope that it's come through in this panel as well that it's the, the strength of the relationships that people have on an individual basis are very strong. 
And the, the story that Alison in particular told of being a student who went on an internship, who came back and worked for the company, that is the sign of, of, a, of a place where people know each other and they take time to get each to get time to get to know each other and to work effectively with each other. So it might be a slightly banal answer, but I do think that the strength of personal relationships is, is really key to making partnerships work um, effectively. And part of that in turn means that we have a clear sense of, of what, what the partnership means for all of us. So in the case of the arts festival, it's wonderful to see people using our theatres. Um, we opened a, a theatre on campus in 2017 and knowing that the arts festival were going to come in and use the space meant that we knew that they were going to give our space a great workout and, uh, and really, you know, test its limits. But also perhaps more inspiringly, what it means is that when we have our, our students coming through at BA and MA level, we can point to the fact that there is world-class art being made all around them all the time by the Arts Festival, by Druid, by companies like Moonfish and by, by PhD students like Jeremy as well. So I, I think it's, um, as I said, I think that with partnership, I think a key element of it is, is knowing what your own part in it is, but in ensuring the strength of those relationships. Um, I think we may need to start to introduce our, uh, our performances at this point in time. So I might now just call upon Dr. Charlotte McIver just to, to tell us a little bit about the performances that are, are going to happen um, afterwards. So Charlotte, can you, um, yeah, there's Charlotte. So hello everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here today. It's been a real pleasure to get to sit and listen to so many colleagues, students, former students, friends here on the panel today. And it's my delight now to introduce two performances that we hope you'll stay around for over the next approximately two hours. So first up, we have Sacrificial Wind, which is an adaptation of the classic Greek tragedy, Iphigenia. It's an adaptation by our lecturer in Spanish and poet Lorna Shocknessy, directed by Max Haffler, who lectures in, in drama within our department as well. It's a poetic examination around the characters and the story of the sacrifice of Iphigenia, and it asks big questions about war, patriarchy, and society. You've heard a lot on this panel today about the network of, of alumni, of theater makers and artists living in Galway, and indeed many familiar faces to us from within the community will be featured within this performance. I also wanna note that this performance is being presented as part of NUI Galway's Arts in Action series, which presents professional arts events weekly, usually in semesters one and two for students and staff. The program was founded by our um, dear staff member, Mary McPartland, who left us, who passed away last year. She worked with Druid, indeed many or most of the arts organizations represented on this panel today. So this performance as well is explicitly in honor of her and you'll get to hear a bit more about her and um, the kind of teaching we do in the department in introducing that performance. After the first performance, which is from 6.30 to 7.30 approximately, you will get to see a full length work from our own Jeremy Sear Cook as part of his company Kushla Productions in association with drama and theater studies as part of his PhD. This is a perform, this work is, a, is devised uh, for and adapted from the short horror story La Horla by Guy de Maupassant and it is called Imperceptible. It's a devised work of virtuosic and exciting physical theater following a man's slow descent into madness after being visited by what he believes to be a supernatural creature. And Sear Cook's performance being presented today as part of this program, along with Sacrificial Wind, is I hope will show to you what happens in the city of Galway when we combine the work of the university with the work of the professional arts community, when we use pieces of art to ask deep questions, but also to create great theater. So we hope you'll stay around and if you want to ask any questions of the artists following you can email drama at nuigalway.ie and indeed you'd all be very welcome back next week to Arts in Action for a traditional music concert from Marcin O'Connor, Shami O'Dowd and Cahill Hayden which is on March 10th Wednesday at 1 p.m. and you can follow us on Arts in Action on social media and RSVP for that through Eventbrite. So lots to choose from today and hopefully in the future when you come back to be with us. That brings uh, our, our panel to a conclusion. So I'd like to thank everybody, not just for, for joining us, but also for staying with us. It's, it's been great to see such a high number of people. 
And um, thank you for, for staying. Thank you for listening. I do hope we get the opportunity to welcome as many of you as possible to Galway in person when we get to the other side of this pandemic and you get to see some of these great artists and encounter some of the uh, some of the nice whiskey from Mahaskara as well, of course, um, in, in due course. Um, but all that remains to be said is to thank our panelists for their time and for their expertise and their advice. It's been really great to hear from them all. And um, thank you all. Hope you enjoy the performances and they'll begin shortly. <laughs>